بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to come together once again with our brothers in Islam here in Fanar in Doha, Qatar Alhamdulillah we've had a lot of good trips here a lot of good sessions with the brothers, and we ask Allah that this will be another one of them, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, tonight and Thursday's lecture, usually I don't give lectures on Thursday night. I usually refuse to do it because it's the last day of the week and it's difficult. I guess as a listener, it's easier than uh, the person who's talking. And I used to give the lectures, but I, I almost had several accidents going, falling asleep while driving, so I stopped giving them. But today, alhamdulillah, I'm on vacation today, and I didn't have to go to work today, so... When the brothers asked me to come, I said, okay, it'll be okay, I'll be rested when I come. So tonight's lecture, I want it to be something, obviously it's Thursday night, after a, a, a week in the office. I want something that we can unwind to and benefit from and at the same time. So I looked into some of the stories from the Sunnah, from the Salaf, and I found a story that stuck out to me, which I taught to my students in the school where I work some time back. A story that happened with... Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu an. Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he became the Khalifa, the ruler of the Muslims, he used to go out during the night time to mingle with the masses, to see what was happening throughout the community. Now, as the scholars mentioned, there were several reasons for this. Probably the two main reasons was, first of all, to see the people who were in need and what their needs were, because he could gather this information during the night. And also, one of the things that he used to gain from this is to see, for example, if it was any munkir, anything that was being haram done during the nights. Because as you know, the shayateen like to move at night time. That's why you find a lot of people who are up to haram, up to no good. This is the time that they like to move. So it's from the duty of the, of the ruler to make sure he does his job. So he was out during this night, and he was with his servant by the name of Aslam, and they decided to rest. And when they decided to rest, they rested against the wall of a house. And as they were resting, they overheard a story, or uh, between, uh, or a conversation, or a conversation between a girl and her mother. Now this family, they didn't have any men to take care of them, and they're risk or the provision they used to get their, their money from was selling milk. They were milkmaids. So the milk was becoming less and less they had and the situation they were in was very difficult and very tight. So the mother was looking for a way out. How can we make more money and fast? So Shaitan, obviously he had the solution. He came to her and he said, I'll tell you how to do it. He said, all you have to do is add a little bit of water. He said, if you add a little bit of water, nobody's going to know, because it's going to be a little bit. It's not going to really change the taste. Maybe 15, 20%, 10%. But think about the money that will come in return. If you add 15% water, it's going to be, and then it's just going to taste like pure milk. Nobody's going to know the difference. At the same time, you're going to have 15% more, and with the money you get back. And with that money, you can do this and this and this. Maybe they have some loans they have to pay off. They have to take care of, of whatever needs they need around the house. You can take care of this money. You need this money. So it's not really a big thing. It's a small percentage. So when she said this to her daughter, she said, let's mix it so we can get some more money. Her daughter said to her, did you not hear what Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar al-Khattab, and what he said to the people today? She said, no, I didn't. He said, he said to the people, verily, do not mix water with milk. Because obviously this is haram, to cheat the people. And he warned about this, and one of his reminders that he gave to the people. So the mother said to the daughter, Barely, Omar cannot see us now. It's in the middle of the night, nobody can see us. We go out to the market in the morning with our milk. Nobody's going to know if we mixed it or not. So he said, if Omar can't see us, 
Verily Allah can see us. After this, Umar ibn Khattab عنه, was so impressed by this girl and her iman and her stance. At the, pay attention because it was the time of need. They were in need. And here's a way to make more money and fast. And she refused to do it because of her muraqaba, her, her knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see her and knows what she's doing. And it's behind closed doors. So Umar, first of all, he sent out some of his troops to see if these ladies were married or not. So they came back to him and said that both of these, and the, both the mother and the daughter are not married. So he gathered up his sons, Abdullah, Abdurrahman, and Asim. And he said to them, uh, I found this and this and this from this girl in this house, and I want one of you to marry her. Obviously she's pious. This is the most important thing in the marriage. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, marry the woman for four things. One of four. What are the four? Uh, the beauty first, okay, let's bring the beauty. Then what else? Huh? The tribe. Her deen, and what else? Money. Money is important these days, right? A lot of people get married for money these days, right? So the most important thing, the Prophet says, which one? The deen, her religion. But he mentioned the four things. So immediately he went to her and said, this, I found this woman. And this is how the people, all of the Salaf that they were, when they looked into the wife, because they know the importance, it's not just, obviously she has to have some beauty, because the Prophet said, he said, look at her. Look at what caused you to marry her. So the, 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 a, a part of beauty is important, obviously in, in the woman and in the man, for both of them. However, the most important thing is the deen. And that's why he wanted one of his children to marry them marry this, this, this girl when he saw what she had from the taqwa and the implementation of the taqwa in her life. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, when his wife, his first wife, Umm Salih, died, and uh, Salih, by the way, he was a famous scholar of Islam. He's, he's known by the kunya Abu Abdullah, which was from his second wife. Because the best names to Allah, most, uh, most beloved names to Allah as it came in the hadith, is Abdurrahman and Abdullah. So he was called there Abu Abdullah. But his first wife, his first big eldest son from his first wife was Saleh. So when Um Saleh passed away, he was, uh, they looked for a wife for him. They said, we found two perfect candidates for you. They said, one of them, she's very beautiful, and her, and her skin color, nice complexion, everything. And the other one is from a dark complexion, and she's not as beautiful as the other one. And some of them said also that she had a problem with her eye. She was like missing her eye, or her eye didn't open or whatever. She only had one eye. So Imam Ahmed, he immediately asked, which one is stronger than her deen? So they said the other one who is less in beauty and her complexion is darker. And he said, this is the one I want. He went for the deen immediately. And she became the, ima, the mother of Imam Abdullah ibn al-Imam, the son of uh, Imam Ahmed, who was the famous narrator of, of, the, of thousands of hadith from his father and a famous scholar of Islam. The point is, is that Abdullah and Abdurrahman, the sons of Umar, they both said, we have enough wives, and we're not in need to get married today. Asim said, I'm interested, and I want to marry her. Later, when he married her, what came from their offspring? Does anybody know the story? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was born from them, their, their grandchildren, from the offspring. The point is, is that what we want to gain from the story tonight. The story, perhaps a lot of you know the story. And these stories, a lot of us, we study them, we know them, we memorize them. But we want to know what do we gain and what do we benefit. And now comes your part in the lecture. You thought you were going to come and get a free lecture, now you have to give back. So we want to know what do we gain from this lecture. From this, uh, from this story, excuse me. Huh? Ah, very good. The importance of picking a pious wife. And that, we said it from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and what comes from the offspring. That when you pick somebody who is, who is pious, a woman who is pious, what is the effect this has on the marriage itself? Obedient to, uh, obedient to her husband. Is it wajib for her to be obedient to her husband or mustahab? You sure? We can turn the mic off so the sisters don't hear. Don't worry. Is it wajib or mustahab? That's wajib, obviously, for her to be obedient to her husband. Okay? 
What else? If the marriage is built upon taqwa, two pious people, they're married now. What else do we get from the, from the marriage? The offspring, and it most likely, it's not 100%, but most likely, and the offspring will be good. Even if they're not practicing 100%, you're going to see the effect. And I'll tell you a story that happened to me. I visited one of the most famous scholars of our time. And when I visited him and his household, uh, his children, I found that most of them, they weren't like, you know, practicing like big beards and things like this. But you could see the effect of the upbringing of the Sheikh had had on, on these children. Their love for Islam, the manners, the manners they gained from Islam. You could see this in them. And that's one of the most important things. So you'll see that it's got to have some effect on them. Even if they don't turn out 100% like their father. Because not everybody is going to be a scholar just because the father is a scholar. Or a da'i because his father is a da'i. And they always give the example of this with Imam Malik rahimahullah. They said Imam Malik, he had a son when he used to sit and teach hundreds or thousands of people in the, in the Prophet's mosque alayhi salatu wasalam, in Medina. His son would be outside playing with the pigeons. He used to train pigeons. And his thing would be to let them fly and come back to him. This was his thing. Like now the people were into football and all this other stuff, wasting their time. That was his son. So the people used to look at Imam Malik. You're the Imam, everybody's going to look at your son. He said, Hidayah is, is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not me. I've done my job as the father. And that's, that's the way he went. He wasn't like a, an evil guy, but that was his thing. He wasn't really into knowledge. But he had a daughter on the other side. How was she? You might know her story. They said if anybody messed up, when they were reading the Muatta, the famous book of Hadith, which is the oldest collection of Hadith that we have today in the written form, that Imam Malik, if anybody were to make any type of mistake, a small mistake, she would immediately knock on the wall from behind them to tell them there was a mistake. And maybe her, her father wouldn't even pay attention, but she was, they say, she might have even been stronger than her father in knowing the book. So you see how, and it comes, alhamdulillah, there will be a positive effect that's important on the kids. The story of Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Sa'id al-Musayyib, who was the, the, considered the imam of the tabi'een, or the, one of the greatest scholars of the tabi'een. They call him Sayyid al-Tabi'een. When one of his students, who used to always come to the lesson, missed one lesson. For some reason, he didn't understand why he missed, never missed any lessons. And he came to him, he said, where were you yesterday? He said, my wife passed away, and I was burying her during the time of the lesson, so I had to miss it. And then he started asking, are you going to get married again? And he said, obviously I want to get married, but nobody will marry me because I'm very, very poor. So Sheikh, uh, Imam Sa'id ibn Musayyib, later on that night, he came to his house. Because he knew this was a good student of knowledge, somebody who had taqwa, somebody who feared Allah, he knows this, this student. So the student hears a knock on his door during the night time. Man, who is it? He said, Sa'id ibn Musayyib. For him, a great honor. Imagine the greatest scholar of our time knocking at your door at night, how are you going to feel? So he's very honored. But what brings Imam Sa'id to my house during this, this time? So then he brought, and he, he said, this is my daughter, your new wife. He brought him to, he, he brought him to marry his, his daughter. Obviously his mother interfered and said, I won't let her let you have her until she's prepared for you properly. So obviously they spent a few days preparing her until they were, and he gathered together in the marriage. But the point is, is that after they finished their seven days together as it came in the sunnah. This man got up to go out of the house. And she said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to your father's halaqa, to the circle where I study with your father, Imam Sa'id. And she said, sit down and verily I will teach you the knowledge of Sa'id. Because everything he has, I have it. You're not going to learn anything new, I'll teach you. So you see what happens, the pious upbringing, how it has on the children, when the two pious parents are married together. Anything else? The marital problems. And is it impossible? To, is it possible to have a marriage without problems? It's not possible. All of us have problems. It doesn't matter how good of a Muslim you are, how much you practice the Quran and Sunnah. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he was better than me and better than you and better than all of us. And he had problems with his wives. So it's going to happen. It has to happen. There's no perfect marriage. But when the two people have taqwa, they have fear of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and their iman and the nasus or the text of the Qur'an and Sunnah is strong. What happens when they differ? Uh, first of all, I take it back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else? 
They submit to the ruling. So now, let's give an example now for the divorce. Is divorce something like in Islam? It's not something like. Some say it's mukru, and there's a difference of opinion as the hadith. Uh, is it authentic or not authentic that the most disliked halal to Allah is divorce? Abghad al halal al Allah al talaq. And a lot of the scholars don't say it's authentic, and some of them say it is. We're not going to get into that. But the point is, there's other texts which can support the meaning of this hadith. For example, if you look at how are you supposed to divorce the woman? When you divorce her? Anytime? Not during her menses. Not during a time that you have been with her. You wait until she has her menses. And then after she finished her menses, this is the sunnah to divorce her like this. But what if she's just finished her menses and you want to divorce her? Because divorce usually, when does it happen? At the time of happiness? When you're out, of, you're out at dinner, you have a nice evening, nice Thursday night out after the lecture with the sheikh. And by the way, you know, we're getting a divorce. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that, right? So it has to be some, some anger in it from both sides. So Islam came to cut that off. Said not the, way, the sunnah way to this divorce her after she finishes her menses. So after a month's time, usually the things die down, right? After that, how long is she, does she have to stay in her husband's house? What happens now? She says, no, no, divorce me if you're a man. Throw me out. Take me back to my father's house. What happens? He does it. So it goes against the sunnah. But if you follow the sunnah, you have two people who believe in the Quran and sunnah, and this is the most important thing in their life. When they implement it and act upon it, is he going to divorce her right away? Now he's going to wait and she's going to stay until she has three minces. And what is the hikmah behind this? As I said, it came in Surah At-Talaq. Allah. Who knows the verse? amra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make something come out of this. That's why she's supposed to even wear like her makeup and look nice in the house and him the same thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make something between them so it will come back and they won't be in divorce after this. So Islam obviously doesn't like divorce. So when you come to the issue of acting upon the Quran Sunnah, look at the effect it has on the marriage as well. What are some other things we benefit from this? From this story. Anything else? Patience. Okay, where do we get patience? Okay, we could benefit patience. Uh, is it easy for a, 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 a the the, the child to go against what their parents say, if they're trying to disobey Allah. So you need patience and deal with that. That's, that's good. But what else other than patience? I'll write that one down. Good will always come from it. Very good. But the issue is Shabab of muraqaba. What does the word muraqaba mean? Uh, to watch with your own self in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching you. Tayyip, so this now is a very, very important aspect of Islam. The issue that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's always watching you. He always hears what you say. And we learn this and we take this from the girl's stance. When she said, if Omar can't see us, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَانَا Then verily Allah, He sees us. So it is one of the main things we gain from the story actually is the muraqab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be mindful that Allah sees us and He hears us. Then where does this come from? How can we have this strong in our hearts? How can we have this strong in our hearts? Ah, this is Tawheed, Mumtaz. It starts from the pure and authentic Tawheed. When you have pure Tawheed, and you're fearful and mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His names and attributes. Not like some of the people who deviated in this, who said, no, these don't mean anything. These names don't have no meaning. We just read them like this. SubhanAllah. You're playing with the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He hears and He sees. And He said in the verse, لَيْسَ كَمِتْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَسَمْعِ الْبَصِيرِ There's nothing like upon to Him. And He is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. So when you have this in your heart, when you, the effect of it, you have it in your heart, this is when you see the, the, the reality of the muraqaba. It's very easy now. Let's say, for example, if somebody is, doesn't have a lot of money, everybody in the workplace has a Blackberry or an iPhone. Got some nice iPhones here, mashallah. Nobody can see us. 
and, and the mix and everything is given given the Sheikh Islam that you know I can push it into my pocket. The brother will come, hey, where'd my iPhone go? And now I have to pay any a few thousand for it or how much it costs. What stops you from doing that? Or if you walk into somebody's office and you see something valuable sitting there. He has a stack of five hundreds, ten thousand just sitting there. And you have to pay off some loans and you're in, in bad situation. What stops you from taking it? You're not gonna get caught. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the muraqab, one second it comes back. So this issue of iman. And a lot of us, we have an issue with this. If you're behind closed doors, a lot of us can go astray. If the door shakes, it moves from the wind or something like that, what does he do? He jumps, he's scared. Who's going to catch me, do what I'm doing? And he forgets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at it. So it goes back to the issue of tawheed. When the tawheed is pure, when the tawheed is strong, this is when you can act upon the muraqabah. In the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, the Prophet sallallahu is a young boy. It shows the importance of Tawheed. He taught him the reality of Tawheed, even at a very young age. To show that Tawheed is not something, they say it's no longer important. All of us say, La ilaha illallah. Let's focus on the bigger picture. And let's focus on the issue of politics. Are politics important in Islam? They're important. I'm not going to say they're not. But is it more important than Tawheed? It's not more important. Tawheed is the, is the origin of the Da'wah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and the original da'wah of all of the anbiya. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا For what? وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا Why? Why do you say? وَجْتَرِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ To worship Allah and to stay away from a ta'gut. From the people who say, La ilaha illallah and not to join partners with him. This is the basis the base of all of the da'wah of the prophets. This is the da'wah of all of the prophets. And then he said to Ibn Abbas, the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Ghulam, inni wa'alimuka kalimat. Oh boy, or any young man, I will teach you some words. Ihfadillah yahfadak. Ihfadillah tajuhu tajahak. He said, Ihfadillah. To be mindful of Allah, or protect Allah. Allah will protect you. To be mindful of Allah, you will find Him. In front of you. He said, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَسَأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعِنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ If you ask, only ask who? Allah. If you see somebody's assistance, only seek the assistance of who? Of Allah. He said, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّةَ لَوْ اجْتَمَعَتْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفَعُوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَنْفَعُوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبُهُ اللَّهُ لَكَ وَنَجْتَمَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُضُرُّوكَ بِشَيْءٍ and to know that the ummah, if they come together to benefit you with something, they will never benefit you with anything except for that which Allah has decreed for you. And if they come together to harm you with something, they will never harm you except for that which Allah has decreed for you. And he preaches him the importance of all of the aspects of Tawheed in this hadith. Of being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the effects it will have on you. Also from the things that we benefit from this is the issue of a principle mentioned in one of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where it came, لا طاعة المخلوق في معصية الخالق That there's no obedience to the creation and the disobedience of the Creator. There's a very important principle, a very important rule in Islam. It doesn't matter who it is, even your mother or your father, your boss at work, or the ruler, or whoever it might be. It's haram for you as a Muslim to do something that's haram. Here, the, the closest person to your mother and your father. This girl here, her mother is telling her to do this. So Islam ordered us to obey our parents, except for in that which is haram. So also there's a rule and a principle we gain from this, from this uh, story that we need to act upon it in our lives as well. And the haram, when it started to spread throughout the Muslim societies and the corruption, how did it happen? By people obeying other people and the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also from the things we gain is the importance of the muhasibah of yourself, to hold yourself to account. And we gain this also from the issue of the muraqaba, of being mindful of Allah, because when you hold yourself to account for your deeds, what happens in the end? For example, some of our mashaykh, they taught us a way we're in Medina to train ourselves, which was to write things down. 
So we used to write, if you would make the takbir al-ula, when you go to the masjid, did you make it today or not? Not just the jama'ah, you have to be there for the first takbirah. Did you read a juz of the Qur'an? Did you pray Qiyam al-Layl for an hour at night? All of these things. And when you actually have it written down, you see it in front of you at the end of the, end of the week, you'll su- be surprised. Because shaitan will make you remember all the good things you did, make you forget all the bad ones. That's why the salaf, the scholars used to say, before you go to sleep, you should go through what you did every day. Hold yourself to account. What good did you do? Build on it tomorrow. Continue. Make it better. What bad did you do? Try to erase it. Because it, when you hold yourself to account every night, you realize their reality. Alhamdulillah, I did some good things today, I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow, even better. I did some bad things, I'm going to stay away from it. Because what happened in the past, you can't really fix it, right? Something's done, and you don't know if you're going to make it, but you make toba before you go to sleep. And if you have another chance, you'll strive to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also the importance of keeping good company. You take it, if you look at the issue, because when somebody calls you to do that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it a pious person usually? Uh, it's usually it's somebody, who's, is, is somebody who's weak in their iman, somebody who's gone astray. Perhaps this one wasn't astray, but she got weak. So if her daughter wasn't strong, what would have happened to all of them? And then all of the sin that would have spread through the community from them cheating the people. Also we gain the danger of cheating in Islam. The danger of cheating in Islam. And we gain as well the importance of the ruler doing his job to make sure that nobody is cheated. To make sure that nothing haram goes up or, uh, wrong in the society. And that's why Umar ibn Khattab, he was doing the same thing as who he used to do. Who was he following? The pro- uh, before, him, before him? The Prophet ﷺ. Because the Prophet him, he used to go out and he would check things himself. What is the famous hadith about staying away from ghish, about cheating, the dangers? Whoever cheats us is not from us. Does anybody know the beginning of the hadith? This is the famous part of the hadith, the last part. Uh, very good. Uh, what happened is the man, he, Prophet was walking through the souq to the market, and he found a person who was selling some grain or whatever, and he put his hand inside of it, and he found the bottom was wet. So he said, مَا هَذِيَ صَحِبَ الطَّعَامِ He said, what is this? The person owns the grain or the food. And he said, أَصَابَتُ السَّمَاءِ That it rained upon the grain. He said, I didn't want to be able not to sell it, so I want to show the good, that part of it was still good. And he said, why don't you show both of it, both parts of it? And he said, because barely whoever cheats us, مَنْ غَشَّنَا Whoever cheats us is not from us. Subhanallah. So you see, the Prophet was out checking the things himself. And this is the duty, the responsibility of anybody who is a ruler, or even if you're in charge of something in your company. If you're somebody who's the mudir, or you're a department, a qism in your, in your company, you're in charge of it, it's a great responsibility. Because on the day of judgment, who's the first person going to be asked about that? You. Allah is going to ask you. If you're somebody... In any company, if you're somebody who is, is the, the mudir, somebody who's in charge, the head of the, the company, the head of a certain department, you're going to be asked about the responsibility. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he described in a beautiful description in the hadith, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسُولٍ عَنْ رَعِيَتِهِ All of you is like a shepherd. The ra'i is a shepherd. And in the translation of the hadith, is all of you are, is responsible. But the literal, trans, literal translation to the hadith is, all of you is like a shepherd. Because the shepherd is responsible for his flock, right? If, so, if somebody, or if, if, a, if a wolf comes and eats from the, uh, the flock, whose fault is it? The shepherd's. So he's responsible for it. If they all go away and get lost, it's the, 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 the job of the shepherd. So we, we learn from this story as well the importance of responsibility and being responsible when we're put in charge of something as Muslims. And we mentioned the dangers of cheating as well. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned in another hadith that if the two people in the sales transaction, if they're honest with one another, بُورِكَ لَهُمَ فِي بَيْعِهِمَا He said. فَإِذَا صَدَقَ If they're truthful in their transaction with one another, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put barakah, blessing in them, in their, in their transaction. And that's why you always find the person who's clever when, he's, when, he's, when he sells, he's somebody who's honest. 
And everybody respects somebody who's honest. And that's why you'll find somebody, even if he doesn't make a lot of money in his business in the beginning, eventually you'll find lines in front of his store, in front of his restaurant. Why? Because this person's honest. If somebody cheats you, are you going to go back to him again and buy something from him? Never. So shaitan fools the people to get the quick money. But it always comes back on you. Now in the United States of America, over 56% of the people who are in jail, might be more now, this is uh, old information I have, 56% of them, of the people who are incarcerated in prison, a drug-related charge for drugs. So why do they get involved in selling drugs? Maybe some of them selling, some of them using. Why do you get involved in selling drugs? Fast money, and big money. Now he might work all month, make $2,000. And he can work in selling drugs, being a small-time drug dealer, make $1,000 a day. That's 30000 a month. So now, shaitan came to him, the fast money, the, the fast life, all of this. Now, as he's, in, as he's spending 20 years in jail now, you think he regrets it? Yeah, he's thinking about it two and three, every day he's thinking about it. Maybe I shouldn't have went that path. So shaitan will fool you. So the Prophet said, he said, if, they, if, they sadaqa, if they're truthful, Allah will put barakah for them in, the, in, the, in, their, uh, in their business. And that's what we need to focus on as Muslims are benefiting from this. Also, we benefit from the story, the importance of raising our children, a proper upbringing, and the effect it has on them. We mentioned this before, the effect of the, of the marriage. But also, it's not just the fact that you're pious. It's not, it's not just going to rub off on them. Also, you have to teach them you have to educate them and show them. And obviously the most important thing is the example. Is the role model they see in front of them. That's why a lot of people now, they don't realize when they're doing something bad, their kids are doing something bad. I remember when I was in America before I became Muslim, one of our, 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 our family's friends, I was 16, I went to visit them in the house, and the lady put out a cigarette, we were actually we were driving down the road. So we're driving their car, the lady pulls out a cigarette, she starts to smoke. Her daughter is 15, she was young, one year younger than me. She pulls out her pack of cigarettes and starts to smoke. Now in America, by law, you have to be 18 to buy cigarettes. And my family, even though they're not Muslims, they, they have some good qualities. And I, I can imagine myself 15, pulling out a cigarette from my mother. And if it was from my father, it would have been, you know, nothing. He wouldn't have said anything. It would have been automatic uh, <laughs> strike to the head. And, and I, was, I, was, I was amazed. How can this woman let her 15-year-old daughter smoke in front of her? But she said something to me, I still remember it even today, all these years later. She said, how can I tell her not to do something I do? So I thought about that, you know, when I learned more about Islam when I became Muslim. I was like, in a way she's right, I'm obviously wrong for letting her, because you're not supposed to do that. But it has some, it makes some sense. Because when you, and, that, and that's why the sha'ir and, and the, the verse of poetry, uh, it said in Arabic, لا تَنْهَا عَنْ خُلُقٍ ثُمَّ تَأْتِي مِثْلُهُ عَارٌ عَلَيْكَ إِذَا فَعَلْتَ عَظِيمُ in this verse of poetry, he said, don't to, to tell the people, don't do something, and then to do it yourself. He said, it's an ape's a fault in you to do something like that. When you tell somebody, don't do something, you do it. And Allah said in the ayah, كَبُرُ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ It's a big thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do something that you do not say. So obviously the most important thing is the role model. And so you know, tests have proven that the majority of children, no matter which direction they go in life, that their, their main characteristics they'll have in their life is taken from the young age, from what they see at home. Before what they see even on TV and on this, what they see from their mothers and fathers, that has the biggest effect. There can be changes made later, but it's very difficult to get them out of their ways. So the main thing, it was from what they gained from their parents. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he mentioned, and we're now here in a da'wah center, we always call the people who became Muslim, what? Reverts, right? Because of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he said, all, all the, of the, the creation, they were born on the fitrah, on the instinct. The human instinct is to worship Allah as one and not join any partners with Him. And then his mother and his father, Yehowedani, Yehwainasirani, Yehwainasirani, that they make him into a Christian or a Jew or into a fire worshiper or whatever. And this is why the effect, once again, we see that the parents have and their upbringing on the children. We also gain from this story the importance of following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in all aspects. And we see that Umar ibn al-Khattab was doing that when he was going out, seeing how the people were doing. 
and also the importance of forbidding the good, uh, for, forbidding the evil, and calling to good. And also we gain from the following of the Sunnah what came from his offspring. The importance of following the Sunnah. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He was considered by a lot of scholars to be what? The fifth Khalifa of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Because he was so much like his grandfather Umar ibn Khattab, obviously great-great-grandfather. But he was so much like him in his ways and like the other Khulafa as well, that they considered him to be the fifth rightfully guided Khalifa. Also from the things we can gain from the story is that change is always possible for all of us. No matter how far away you might have gone from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how many sins you might have done, you can always return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is Umar al-Khattab. Umar al-Khattab before Islam. Was he a good guy? I mean, he was a great guy after Islam. Don't feel bad about saying it. He was not a good guy before Islam. He might have had some good qualities, but he was not a good person. How did he used to treat the Muslims in the beginning of Islam? Very rough with them. And when he became Muslim, what was he going to do? He was on his way to do what? Kill the Prophet ﷺ. He had enough, khalas, of this da'wah, these people changing their religion. He was, going, he was going to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the, the light of guidance into his heart when he heard the Qur'an. He was somebody who used to worship statues. Somebody who had a statue made of dates. And then he would get hungry, he would eat his God, as he said. Somebody who buried his own daughter alive. Somebody who didn't have a good start. But he did have a good finish. Alhamdulillah. So it's another thing we gain from the story. As it came in a hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالِ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ That the deeds are what the end upon. That's an important thing. Is, is, is the ending of, of the affairs. Umar al-Khattab didn't have a good start, but he had a great finish. And he changed to become the second greatest man in Islam after the Prophet ﷺ and after Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Somebody that he, if he walked down the road, the shaitan would take the other path. Shaitan feared him because of the strength of his iman. Somebody who strove night and day to help Islam, to spread Islam. So we gain from this the beauty of the change or the reality that we can change and change is possible for all of us. And we look into the stories, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, <coughs> of the Salaf, we remind ourselves of the importance of benefiting from these stories. Not just to, to read them, to say them in a way uh, so we know about, oh yeah, I know that story. So what did you benefit from it? Tomorrow, how many of us are going to read Surah uh, Al-Kahf? A lot of us, if not all of us, inshallah. Then what do you gain from that story? You ever thought about the benefits? You ever think about why the Prophet used to tell us to read every Jum'ah? What's in it? We need to reflect on these meanings. Reflect on, on the stories of the Qur'an, the stories of the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu the stories of the, of the Sahaba, to benefit from them and gain from them. This is just something... I want to remind myself and my brothers with here tonight in my trip to Doha. And Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad.